Hi everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 100, the Jason York Hockey Journey, part two, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we jump back in, not dipping our toes in the shallows, we're jumping into the deep end and reignite this conversation. If you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, then I have the world's largest database of off ice stick handling, passing, and hockey shooting drills, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck. Just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person, off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to SweetHockeyCoach.com, that's Sweet hockeycoach.com and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. My next guest is former NHLer, broadcaster, and current podcaster Jason York. He's back for part two of his hockey journey as he's apparently one of the special ones and gets a second episode because we couldn't get her done in the first one. I'm super excited to jump back in so ladies and gentlemen Please help me in welcoming Mr. York back to the show. Yorkie, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. <laughs> are, we, are we on now on a Mr. basis here? You're Mr. Pitlick and I'm Mr. York. Well, we're in our 50s now, so I think that uh, we both have kids. So, yeah, we'll get to Mr. York, Mr. Pitlick once in a while. I love it. <laughs> uh, so, just, uh, we, we didn't get... We didn't have enough time to, to get everything in last time. And unfortunately, there was a bit of a, a break in between uh, the first episode and this one where I have done a number of episodes in between them because you were on spring break and then I had uh, a few things going on um, that we just couldn't connect until today. So um, how was where did you go again on spring break? Oh, how was it? It was awesome. We went to Manzanillo, Mexico. And uh, the great thing about this spring break, there were no kids involved, it was just me and my wife and three, uh, and, and oh, no, three other nice. couples. So, yeah, because all my all my like you, Pitt, my kids are all older now, so they're all in college doing their thing. Uh, so yeah, Manzanillo, Mexico, which is below Los Cabos, way down below. So a long time to get there, but once we got to Mexico, it was it was awesome. It's um, it's one of those places too where I'll put it this way: compared to going on vacation in the United States or somewhere else, I think your money goes like twenty times as far in Mexico. It's it's crazy. Yeah, we really? we had a great we had a great time. Weather was awesome. Um, we actually had a house. And the house we were in, we had our own personal bartender, which was awesome. So a lot of, a lot of margaritas, a lot of pina coladas. It was a great, great time. So I don't, I don't mean to bring darkness into this <laughs> at all, but there um, was there any concern about what was going on down in Mexico with the, the people yeah. that they believe they got, they got, uh, they got well, killed? Well, that's the first thing we researched because the only reason we we're going on this trip. Uh, it, my my wife and I and three other couples, we were at one of those charity events. You know when they start doing an auction and something comes up for a bid? The, we're all there. Yeah. And we've had a few glasses of wine. So we decided to bid on this Mexico trip, knowing no idea where it is, what's going on. <laughs> we get the trip. So uh, fast forward two years later, we got to use this trip and all this crap is going on in Mexico. Uh, but we researched it. And once we got down there, Manzanillo is – is unique. It's, it's, it, it's supposedly far away from all that nonsense that's going on in Mexico. But I did inquire with our driver and I said, so between me and you, how much does, how much <laughs> influence does the, does the cartel have around here in Manzanillo, Mexico? And he goes, listen, he <laughs> goes, there is cartel here because they're involved in the tourism. He goes, they're not going to go after 
uh, tourists and do things. He goes, they want your guys' money in their business. And I go, well, how does it work? He goes, well, basically, we're at a restaurant. He goes, see this nice guy that owns this restaurant? He basically has to play one of the cartels, the other cartel, and the police. So he's got to do three payoffs, and then he's good. So it's it's wow. it's crazy down there, but beautiful. Um, and like I said, we felt safe the whole time. It's not like we were in Mexico City or anywhere like that. This is a very remote place where not a lot's going on. So I, I never felt unsafe. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I was just curious because I've uh, I I think. You know, over 20 years ago, uh, my wife and I were on a cruise and there was a stop in some part in Mexico. But yeah, what? I, you know, I, I don't what, remember. We, we, we went on an anything. excursion one day. We went on a hike and all of a sudden, all of a sudden yeah. I was waiting for one of those scenes of the movie when car pulls up in front of you, car behind you, and all of a sudden you're blocked in. <laughs> we, believe me, we were talking about that when we were in the truck. So, but no, it was, it was all good. It was all good. Uh Awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get back to it. So um, we got to where both of us basically got to to uh, the nation's yeah. capital up in Ottawa, and uh, we start our little window together, our journey together. Um, I guess let's let's start where uh, we talk about Stan Neskash and Sean Hill both going down five games into the season against the New Jersey Devils. And all of a sudden, you and I, uh, maybe we had doubts about where we stood in the lineup or whatever, at least yeah. I did. Uh, it That basically solidified us as a, a full, all-in, everyday NHL player. So why don't you start yeah. there? No, it was, you know, whenever you move teams, you know this, I know this. Um, I was in a position when I came from Anaheim where, where I knew they wanted me. So and I And I had played two previous years in Anaheim. So I was confident, but at the same time, you never know when you get traded. It would have been, a, it would have been a healthy competition between whatever we had there, the eight defensemen. But I think with Pierre Gauthier there, Pitt, and you know, he, he was, he was changing things. Anyhow, I do believe that he was bringing in his people. And at the end of the day, it's, I think Sean Hill went on to Carolina and had a really nice career eventually. And Stan and Stan just yeah. couldn't really get over the injury bug, um, but uh, yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was interesting times in Ottawa, as you know, and and that that first year when I got there and um, and you were there as well, uh, we just had such a nice group. We had a great group. We had a we had a really good group of guys, very tight. And as you know, um, and people that don't know, it was it was historic for the Ottawa Senators. That was the first year that that franchise made the playoffs and it was really special for myself being from Ottawa and knowing how much that meant to the city. Uh, and then from there, uh, our team just got better and better. And I, and I, and for the next five years, because I remained in Ottawa for five years until moving back to Anaheim again as a free agent. But for those five years, the team made the playoffs in all five of those years. So it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun playing on those Senators teams, a lot of great guys, a lot of guys I still keep in touch with. And uh, great memories, just a uh, young team learning how to win. Uh, never really got past that second round. I think we made it to the second round once. But it was uh, th- those were special yeah. times. And um for me, uh, lots of fun. Like I said, lots of fun, lots of good people. I thought the coaches were great. And uh, it was just, that, that, that was a really good time, I think, to be, you know, it was before phones, Pit. It was before social media. And I really felt um, you were still in the NHL and still, you know, in the public eye. But we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun and a lot of good memories. And, and, uh, you know, I look back on those times as, as, as a great time in my life. Yeah, it was. Was that, was that hard? I mean, did you have a lot of childhood friends oh, yeah. and family that, that that was a drain on you to try to keep that all was, organized? You know, at first, it, was, it wasn't really a drain. It was just different because I was in Anaheim where I had nobody there. It was just me and my wife. So nobody was waiting after the games. Nobody was there. We had lots of visitors because in Anaheim, 
it was owned by Disney back then. So I had people down all the time wanting to go to Disneyland. We had these True. free passes that could get you yeah. in. The, it was crazy. But in Ottawa, it was like every day, who am I getting tickets to? So finally, I just said, okay, here's what I'm doing. I bought mom and dad two season tickets. And then my brother had his own tickets. And then I would just give tickets out here and there. And I'd ask guys. And you, basically, I my friends and were on their own. I took care of my parents and uh, gave my family because there was just too many people. And a- after a while, after a while, that kind of wore off. And, and then I just got used to it. Yeah. So how did you end up uh, moving over to your next destination, uh, which was back in Anaheim? How did you get back well, there after five or six years in Ottawa? Well, I never really wanted to leave Ottawa. But you know, you know how it works in the league. When, when, when you don't have success as a team, you got to make changes. So my last year, I was my last year of my contract. It was expiring. I had broken my leg. This is a crazy story. I was playing my fifth year in Ottawa, having a really good year, and I blocked a shot. And I, I went in to see the trainer, and I was telling him something's wrong. I, said, I go, this doesn't feel right. And he goes, oh, there's nothing wrong. It's just a soft tissue issue. For the next month, I didn't practice. And I basically had to put my foot in an ice bucket every single day to get my skate on. And this went on for a month. Uh, no practicing, just just games. Oh, man. And I finally went back to our trainer, um, Kevin Wagner. Was Wags there when you were there, Pip? Uh, so, I think so, yeah. Was it? Nah, was that his first year? What's his? What was his? Uh, Wags. He's always grumpy too. Good guy, but he was always grumpy. So I yeah. finally, finally no, after a month so. of me basically, so basically, picture this: you come off after a period. You got. A, I had a nice bucket waiting in my stall to to get the swelling out of my ankle, so I could put my skate back on after. This went on every day, every game, and then finally after a month, wow. he goes, "You know, I'm gonna." I'm going to send you for a bone scan. So I go for a bone scan. My leg's broken. <laughs> my Just the little bone above your ankle, it's the, uh, what's that called, the tibia? I broke my tip. Distal yeah. tibia? Was was it inside outside. or outside? Outside. So okay, I, I tibia, could play yeah. on it, but my, it was, it was, I wasn't skating great. So anyhow, I had to miss four weeks after playing like shit for a month on one leg. I missed another month. Take me out of the lineup. <laughs> And then this is, again, a little bit more adversity in your career, right? So Ottawa brings up a young defenseman named Carl Rakunik, who's making probably one-fifth of what I make in salary. He's a right shot D. And they plug, they plug him yeah. into my spot with Reds while I'm out for a month. And then uh, and I'm a free agent after that season. So I'm kind of stressed about things, right? The trainer screwed up. Trainer yeah. misdiagnosed you. Then you come back, you miss the entire last part of the season. I got healthy just in time for the playoffs. So we're playing the Toronto Maple Leafs in the first round. And we had finished we had finished first in the division. So we were expected to beat Toronto. So I get back in, but I got a – I'm rusty. So Jacques starts me, I think, in the second or third pairing. And we end up losing the first two games to Toronto. And then he puts me back in my spot in the top pair with Redden and myself in the top pair. But by then, you're down 2 nothing to Toronto. And uh, we ended up getting swept four straight. Four Ooh. straight. So I guess the, the reason I left, injury, swept four straight. Uh, they wanted to promote a younger defenseman. So after that season, I was a free agent. And then uh, I ended up signing at Anaheim because... Uh, Pierre Gauthier had moved on and became the general manager of Anaheim and uh, losing four straight to Toronto and not having a full season due to injuries. My options weren't great. And Anaheim had given me the, Anaheim gave me the best offer. So I went back to Anaheim as a free agent. So that's basically how I ended up back in Anaheim. And what happened on that, that season? Anything uh, noteworthy, spectacular? In Anaheim? uh, Heartbreaking. Oh, yeah, my that God. last year. So I, so I signed a three-year contract in Anaheim, a three-year deal, and Pierre Goch after, after Ottawa, three-year contract. 
my wife and okay. I buy a house there and we're like, this is going to be home. Uh, our first daughter, our first child, Alexander, was born in Anaheim in 1996. Our son, Jack, was born in Ottawa in 2000. And in 01, we go back to Anaheim and my third child is born there. Um, so he's born in 2001. And then the, that season in Anaheim, Brian Murray is the coach. And Pierre Gauthier is the general manager. And we have a terrible team, a terrible team. We're, re we're <laughs> rebuilding. Um, I don't know if you remember a guy named Keith Kearney, another defenseman who played. In the, so Kearns oh, is sure. – Pierre signs Keith Kearney to a three-year deal. He signs me to a three-year deal. We're the number one, number two defenseman. Week two of the season, Kearney breaks his wrist. Week three, I get slammed from behind into the boards, shoulder first. I tear all the muscles in my shoulder, can't lift my arm up. So next day at, I come to the rink, Brian Murray pulls me in the office. He's like, Jason, how's your shoulder? I said, Brian, it's not good. I think it's torn. I can't lift my arm up. We have a game that night. And Brian says to me, he goes, well, do you think you can play? And I said, <laughs> and I said, well, Brian, I can't. I can't lift my arm up. <laughs> he goes, I know, yeah. but Carnes is out. He goes, we can't get somebody up in time. We'd have to play with 5D. Do you think you could suck it up and play? But I look at the trainer who should <laughs> be backing me up and say, no, York's shoulder uh, has no strength. He can't lift his arm. It's week three of the season. You're going to risk injuring it more. So sure enough, the trainer looks down at the floor, doesn't say anything. Brian looks back at me again and says, I really need you to play. Do you think you can play? I look at the trainer. He's like, well, I can work on your shoulder and maybe help get a little bit of the mobility back. So I'm like, yeah, I'll play. And Brian's like, I'll make you a better man. So I, no <laughs> I end up playing another month with an arm. So basically, imagine this. You're going into the corner. And I know you had a bad shoulder, so you know how it feels. You go to hit a guy. And you can't hit him with the bad shoulder, so you got to turn and use the other shoulder. This went on for a month, and then uh, I ended up re-injuring it. And um, so that entire season, they sent me for an MRI, and they said, "Well, you got a lot of old injuries going on in your shoulder. It's it's it's." Uh, and I go, "I've never hurt this shoulder before. There's no old injury here." I go, so. <laughs> I got really bad medical advice that year in Anaheim. I, I ended up playing the entire season with this shoulder with no strength. One day, our assistant coach, Tom Watt, comes up to me. He's like, Yorkie, what's wrong with you? you? You're not playing very physical. I go, Tom, I got one arm. <laughs> I go, he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Forgot about that. So, Kearney waits until he's fully healthy with a wrist, comes back. And then so I, I play that full year at Anaheim. We miss the playoffs. I finish the year with about 25 points. I have a decent year, but I'm playing the year totally hurt. So as that year went on, it became evident that something was fishy going on with the team pit. Like we were, we were under the impression that we were sometimes not doing the right things to win as a team. And uh, so what ended up happening was Pierre Goche got fired and Brian Murray took over as the general manager. So and nope, coach that next summer, he hired Mike Babcock to come in as the coach. Babs comes okay. in for his wow. first ever coaching gig in the NHL. I spend that entire summer. I hire um, a trainer, I have a guy by the name of Lauren Goldenberg who basically helps me rehab my shoulder to the point where I've got it really strong. I've got it protect. I've protected all the old injuries. It's still not great, but I go back to camp that next year. I win all the fitness testing. I win the bench pull-ups. I'm in unbelievable shape. I'm coming back. I want to have a great season. The second day of training camp, I show up to the rink and Mike Babcock brings the team in and he says, guys, Things are going to be different around here. Tomorrow, I'm dividing into an AHL group and an NHL group. So I'm like, cool, whatever. Next day, I show up to come to the rink. 
my equipment is down the hall, out of the main locker room, in the AHL rink, in the NHL room. H- AHL room. Oh, no. <laughs> Myself, Denny Lambert, and German Titoff. All three of us guys were signed the summer before under Pierre Gauthier's watch, under long-term deals. So I knew what was going on. They were trying to move move out Gauthier's yeah. guys. So basically, Brian Murray calls me to his office. He says, you know, guys, Denny, you're done here. You're not going to play here again. German Titoff, same thing. He goes, Yorkie, we're going to try and trade you. He goes, but in the time being, this is the day three of training camp. We want you guys to practice on your own at 1 o'clock. The team will practice at 10. You guys will have your own ice at 1. Just, Just the three of us. What? <laughs> so we are practicing. And here's me. The year before, I played hurt for Brian Murray the entire season. Make you a better man if you play hurt. Blah, blah, blah. I am pissed. So I call my agent and I'm like, tell him what's going on. He's like, they just signed you last year. They're not going to get rid of you. And I'm, and I'm, it's pretty good contract. I'm on a three year making 2 million a year for the next two years. And I'm like, yeah. And my, my agent at the time doesn't believe me. So sure enough, training camp goes on. Denny Lambert was sent home. German Titoff was sent home. They never played in the NHL ever again. Brian said Brian says really? to me, I'm gonna send you down to Cincinnati until we can hopefully trade you. And uh, he goes, You don't have to go if you don't want to. And I said, Well, I want to get paid, so I'm going. So I go down to Cincinnati and I'm there for two and a half weeks. You know, instead of two things gonna happen, right, Pitt? It was like a crossroads for me. I could have went down, collected my money. I just said to myself, you know what, I'm gonna have fun. I'm going to have fun, and I'm just going to play, enjoy the guys down here. So for two and a half weeks, I had a blast. I was out having beers with the boys, playing tricks, playing tricks <laughs> on the guys, like taping guys' blades. So when they go into, on the ice, they'd slip and fall. Like, I, I was having a ball. And I started ha- – I, I was having fun. And I ended up scoring four goals in five games down there. And uh, you remember Ray Shiro. He was in Ottawa for a bit. Ray sure. was the assistant yeah. GM for Nashville. We came down, calls my agent. He goes, why is York and the minors? Doesn't make any sense. And uh, Nashville ended up trading for me because Anaheim basically devalued my devalued me so much. I wasn't worth anything. So they traded, they traded right. for me for $1. <laughs> $1. Really? You're the $1. $1. Man. One $1 dollar, man. And... Anaheim had to pay 1.2 million of my salary and Nashville only had to pay 800 grand. So I wow. go to Nashville and Barry Trotz is there and, and I'm loving it. First thing they, they give me is say, how you doing? How's your body? I say, well, my shoulders still, I tell them pretty what happened. So they send me for an MRI. MRI results come back. They're like, you have a torn labrum. And you have zero cartilage left in your right shoulder. <laughs> They're like, oh, you man. need surgery. And I and I said to them, well, can I hurt it any more than I've already done? And they said, no. And I said, I'll play the rest of the year with, with my shoulder like this. So I ended up finishing the year in Nash. I had a great first year there. Um, did really well. Was playing in the top four. Um, and then after that season pit, I had shoulder surgery from the damage that was done in Anaheim under Anaheim. So I was actually going to go back and sue Anaheim for it because they had misdiagnosed me. They'd lied to me. And uh, I act, I actually confronted yeah. the team doctor when I went back the next year and he apologized. He said that the team was told them that they needed me to play and to go along with the agenda. But I was so pissed and I was so pissed at Babcock for screwing me around and uh, Brian Murray and for everybody doing what they did. But you move on. Why didn't you? Why didn't you sue him? Why didn't you sue him? I, you know what? I was in a good place in Nashville. Uh, things were going great, and uh, but then I had that that surgery at the end of the season, and this is crazy. Uh, the surgery I got for my shoulder was in 
April. And then I rehabbed the, sh the shoulder all summer, went back to Nashville for training camp in September, sitting on yeah. the table and I get my eye exam. You know what you got to do? You go in, you're like, okay, got to do blood test, all your work. Physical. I said, okay, yeah. I'm do the eye test first. So they put me on the table. They test my eyes. This friggin' surgeon goes, you got a torn retina. You have to have eye surgery. I'm like, what? So oh, I man. leave I leave Nashville the first day of training camp, and I go right to the operating table, and they got to sew my eye because I have a torn retina. So I, I end up missing the entire preseason, every exhibition game, every skate of, of, of training camp. And I come back, and I practice twice after – missing a month and a half and I play the season opener in national under two practices, full bubble, full wow. bubble. And then I come back and, uh, switch to a half visor. And then, uh, so I've had a surgery in April surgery in September. And then fast forward to February that season, I'm practicing and Dennis Arkipov runs into me face first in practice on a two on two drill. And his helmet, his helmet yeah. basically goes full force into my head and breaks. I ended up lying on the ground in practice and they had to call the ambulance because I ended up going to the hospital, breaking my cheek, jaw, and orbital bone. So I basically went to the hospital, had to get facial surgery in February and uh, it was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Oh I'm sitting on the table and the doc says to me, he's like, you've brought a broken cheek, you got a broken jaw and just under your eye socket, your orbital bone is broken. So he's going to peel your face back and I'm probably going to have to put some plates in and stuff. And then when you wake up, it should be good. This great surgeon. So I wake up after surgery and the doc's like, you're never going to believe it. I put your face back together and I didn't have to use any plates or screws. It was like, you were put back together like a puzzle just perfectly. So um, anyhow, wow. I had to, again, miss a month, come back after a month, full full bubble on again for the second time that year. And uh, I get back just in time for playoffs. And uh, we end up playing Detroit first round, have a great playoff. And then uh, after that season, we own a house in Nashville. We're ready. We're this is going to be our new home. Got kids in school there. It's 2004, Pitt. Then we had that lockout, and uh, my contract had expired. So we basically sold the house in Nashville. Nashville said to me, you know, you've had three surgeries in eight months. <laughs> we're not, we're not, uh, we're not comfortable re-signing it just with your injury, uh, your injury history. So I ended up uh, coming home. And then we had the lockout in 04. And then just after Christmas, I decided to go over and play in Europe. I was in Geneva. And now it's 2005, March. And I got a phone call in the middle of the night. And I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm, my dad had dropped me off at the airport. I had, that last couple of years was pretty tough, getting screwed around from Anaheim. All the injuries in Nashville. Then we have a lockout. And then I decide to go to Geneva to play. And then I got a call in the middle of the night uh, saying my dad had died. So it was a, it was a, it was a tough stretch, man, with uh, that little three year period of time. But it's kind of what, it's kind of been my MO throughout my career, just kind of bumps. There's always shit happening. There's always stuff. And so when I got the news, my dad died, I just came home from Geneva and uh flew home toughest flight ever by yourself by yourself oh, thinking about things yeah. thinking about thinking about your kids thinking about life thinking about your career and uh <clears throat> no contract you're wondering what you're going to do uh being a junior hockey player you, you don't you're you're kind of lost because you're like okay do i have enough money to retire on am i going to be good um don't know if i can still play anymore because i've been hurt so much so that following year, I had no contract, and I was still kind of depressed from what my with my dad passing away. So I decided um, I waited, waited. It didn't go anywhere on a tryout after the lockout ended. So 
it's September. I got offers for Russia, everywhere. So I decided to go to Switzerland. And uh, this is 2005. I go over to I go over to Switzerland, okay. and I've got, you know, this is 05. So I've got a I've got a five year old, a four year old, and a uh, nine year old daughter. So my wife stays home with the kids. I go over to uh, Lugano, Switzerland, and I'm just grumpy when I'm there. I'm grumpy. I'm complaining. And the Swiss league, it's horrible refing. Um, nobody speaks English. I'm in a town called Lugano. It's uh, predominantly an Italian area of Switzerland. And I'm there and I'm like wishing I should be in the NHL. So I come home for a break in October. And uh, I go back. Because I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about packing it in. So, you know, I, I'm gonna, I go back to Switzerland. I play. And then it's November. And I get a call from age and he goes, St. Louis Blues, St. Louis Blues want to sign you. So I tell my Switzerland team, I'm leaving. I'm going to go play to the NHL. And they're like, hold on a second here. We have it in your contract. <laughs> After November 1st, you can, we will not release you. <laughs> so I snap. I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm, I'm going oh, back no. to the NHL. I've got a one-year deal in St. Louis. Um, I've got a family at home and the, and the GM's like, we're sorry. He goes, but we're in first place. You're a big part of our team. And I said to them, I'm like, well, I'm leaving. <laughs> so I pack my stuff oh, no. up. I head back on a plane, fly home. He's okay. You know, the, and the Swiss people are great. Eh? They're so calm. They're so nice. GM, his name was Jörg. Jörg's like, okay, Jason, I'll call you in a couple days. Maybe you change your mind. So I'm at home. He calls me two days later. Hi, Jason. It's Jörg Eberle here. Um, we'd really love you to come back. I go, I'm not coming back. He's like, okay, I'll call you in a couple days. <laughs> he calls me. <laughs> he calls me two days later, and I'm calling my agent. He's like, I, he goes, I can't get into this contract. He goes, it is what it is. So after a couple of days, uh, talking to my wife and thinking about things, I'm like, well, I, I'll go back. But so I call Yorg and I said, all right, I'll come back. I go, but I have conditions. I go, I want more money. I go, and, and I'm staying in a beautiful place in Lugano. So for anybody listening that's, that yeah. doesn't know what about Lugano, it's an area in Switzerland where there's palm trees. There's a lake there. It's the place there. It's a... Uh, it's like uh, it's, it's called the Ticino area or George Clooney. It's it's had a place there. It's beautiful. So I say I want to I want to mm. continue to live at this place I was at called the Villa Sassa. So they agreed all my demands, agreed to fly my family up, and I said okay, I come back. And when I went back, I said you know what I'm gonna have a better attitude. I'm gonna change how I look at this place, and I'm gonna again kind of like when I went down to the Mars. I'm gonna have fun. So I went back and I had a blast. Like I had fun with the boys and uh, that year turned out to be one of the most enjoyable experiences I had in hockey. Uh, my family came up for Christmas. I played in the Spangler Cup up in Davos. We got great memories from that and um, some great stories from my year in Lugano. We actually um, finished in first place. And when we got to the playoffs, this is hilarious. Our coach, um, Larry Harris got fired after game two of the playoffs. We're it gets, <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a soccer culture there. So the fans are very emotional. So we're expected to win round one. We're playing the worst eighth seed after game two. Sorry. After game two, we're, I think we were playing up in their rink. We drive up to play Omri. The bus comes back. Our fans are waiting for us in the parking lot in Lugano. So I say to one of the Swiss guys, I'm like, oh, this is good. Our, our fans are here to support us, to help bring us back. He goes, that's not why they're here. So the bus stops. <laughs> the fans are shaking our bus. They're yelling at our coach, yelling at the team. So we go into the rink. We go, this isn't good. Um, next day, we have a home game. We lose at home. We have to get a police escort out of our own arena. Our goalie gets oh, no. chased out of the rink by eight fans. He's driving because everyone drives mopeds over there. He's driving his moped. So we leave our little security entrance. Goalie's cruising down the street. I'll never forget eight 
crazy Italian hockey fans chasing the goalie, whipping like apples and fruit at him as he's driving away. He's driving, trying to dodge the fruit. So it, over there, you're supposed to salute your fans after you win a game. So we, okay. what ended up happening after that game? The next day, we had a we had a uh, we had a meeting at the rink, and I wanted to go home at this time. I'm like, you know, this is enough. It's crazy. Fans are nuts here. They're, they're crazy. I go, this is nuts. I want to go home, missing my kids. But for some reason, I get up in the room, and the owners there, the coaches there. Next day, and I say, guys, we got the best team in the Swiss League because we got to believe in ourselves. We can come back and win this series. I guarantee you. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we can. And the owner's like, maybe we can come back. So we end up <laughs> coming back and winning four straight. And But after every, after every wow. game, we refuse to salute our fans. We won't salute them anymore because they attacked us. Then we win round two. And then we go to the finals. We win the finals. And the very last game, we win at home ice. And the entire team, we salute the fans. And the fans the fans yeah. just attack the ice. They jump on the ice. They're all over us. I've got this blue trophy you get, and I'm hosting it up. It's their Stanley Cup. And I've got this awesome picture. There's like a 1,000 people around me. And all I can see is all these hands trying to grab this cup I'm holding. And um, anyway, we <laughs> ended up that night staying in the rink till five in the morning, partying in the dressing room. We had fans in there, champagne. And uh, I remember the owner coming up to me after the game and he's like, York, he has had an Italian. And he's like, we won because of your speech. <laughs> Little did he know that I wanted to go home. <laughs> and oh. he goes, you're going to stay here forever. I goes, one day, he goes, I'm going to give you a three-year contract. And I'm like, oh, whatever. That's great. And, but uh, I ended up staying for a week. And uh, my wife, Laurel, called me like after day seven. She's like, are you ever going to come home? <laughs> I'm like, I'll be home in a couple of days because we're, <laughs> we're having great par- – like the parties were, were, were so awesome. And, and we had so much fun. Oh, and it was man. such a great time. It was, you're kind of just – like it was pro hockey, but it was more – you're playing for – you're playing because you're having fun. And uh, – so anyhow, after yeah. after that season, Pitt, um, I got invited to play in the World Championships. Um, I declined it because uh, I, I had been gone that whole season. So I went home. I went home, and then I had this three-year offer on the table for Lugano to go back and play. And, and I was wow. like, 40 games. Uh, they put your kids in private school. You get paid pretty well. They give you a house, give you a car. But that year, I had played in the Spangler Cup. Um the coach of that team was Dave Lewis ended up getting the job in Boston. And uh, Peter Shrelly was the GM who I also knew. Um, so I, they ended up calling in the summer and offered me a one-year contract to go to play for Boston. And I said to my wife, I'm like, I don't know if I can play in the NHL anymore. I got the shoulders still bad. Um, 36, 37 years old now. Looking back, the, the the prudent thing would have been to take the three-year deal in Switzerland, no stress on the body, drink wine, eat cheese, put the put the kids in <laughs> private school, and uh, but the competitive juices start flowing. Like maybe I can still play in the NHL. So I did the dumb thing and went back, signed in Boston, and here's how. Here's when you know you shouldn't be playing anymore in the National Hockey League. They're doing my physical, and I'm in the room with the doc, and he's testing my shoulders. And there's an older doctor there. So looks at my one shoulder, writes down, yep, works good, moves good. Then he turns around to jot down his information. As he turns around, I flip my body around, so he tests the same shoulder twice, the good shoulder. So I end up... I end up passing oh, no. the physical yeah. for my shoulder. <laughs> so I kind of looked the other way. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I don't remember what yeah, you're doing. Because they're, okay. they're doing so many guys, right? They're testing 70 guys. So yeah. that that year in Boston, um, I ended up hurting my knee like three times. Hurt my knee, hurt my wrist. I ended up playing for, 49 games that year. It got so bad at the end of the season. I remember Dave Lewis coming up to me. He's like, 
you know, you're a great leader. We love you. He goes, but you don't have to play anymore if you don't want it. <laughs> Cause we were out of the, we were out of the yeah. playoffs. And I was to the point where I was hanging around more with the assistant coach than the team. Like I was, I knew I was done, uh, but body couldn't do yeah. it anymore. So that was, that was my last year in Boston. But in saying that, I, I really enjoyed the off ice part. Cause you know, when you're about to be done pit, you kind of realize how lucky you are to play and, how great of a life it is playing in the NHL. I really enjoyed everything that encompassed being in the NHL that year. Had my kids down after every home game, my my kids would come in the dressing room. Dave Lewis was awesome. He always wanted the families in the dressing room. So coach would talk after the game, then kids would come running in. Uh, I'd bring them down the skate in the Boston Garden every every off day. So we had a I had a ton of fun with the family that year. But when that year ended, I, uh, I knew I was done and, and uh, body, body just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And I think that that, that happens um, with a lot of us um, for me. And it sounds for you, you know, you, you, you didn't try to do it one more time, yep. you know, and I didn't either. I, I knew when it was done, it was done, but I'm happy for you because it started in Ottawa with the foot the broken yeah. foot, you're a month or two of that, then all the stuff that happened in Anaheim and the injuries there, and then uh, Nashville, and then you finally got a little break and had some good experiences. But until you decided that, you know, you couldn't go back to the NHL with St. Louis with that one-year contract, uh, you were still fighting it a little bit. But then once you kind of settled in, that turned out to be a spectacular season. So I'm glad that you had uh, – that because I'm sure it was as close to a Stanley Cup as you could get in, in those that I hear, you know, that you win something over in Europe. Oh, I mean, it's it's like it's crazy. It's crazy. I remember they had in, in these little European cities, they have these down these downtown, they're like uh courtyards. And I remember we were up on a balcony and we had this cup, and I'm like, this is crazy. Like these people are it's so important, and people have no idea how big these championships are overseas. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was re- very cool to experience. I have a, still have my ring. They give you a championship ring. Um, and I still have guys I talk to over there that are great guys, but no, really, really unique time of my life and a totally uh, different experience in playing the NHL. Yeah. So you're done playing. Um, what happens next? Did you just kind of hang around watching TV once the kids got uh, put off to school, eating <laughs> chips with your shirt off, watching so Well, you know, so, <laughs> what, so, what happened? Kinda, so one of the things I did my last year in Boston was, so the NHL offers that life after hockey program. So I, I, I signed up yeah. for it that summer after, after Boston. I, uh, I signed up for the broadcasting course. So it's very cool. They, uh, they send you down to Quinnipiac university for a week and it's a full week, uh, 10 hours a day where they teach you. Basically it's like a crash course on broadcasting. So I went and did the first ever course that they offered. It was really good. Like, um, did all the, I think Glenn Anderson was down there, Gary Volk, Bill Ranford, um, and the, the awesome thing was it's, it was uh, paid for by the NHLPA. Like it was a great thing to do. So I took the broadcasting course because I figured I, I wanted to try and become a color commentator and do some, do some media in, in the game. That was my plan. Um, and uh, I actually, sorry, I actually did that the summer before I went to Boston. So I did that that summer. And then when I finished the year in Boston, the Ottawa Senators were in the Stanley Cup finals. And I was done in Boston. So I called the radio station in Ottawa because they used to call me all the time to do interviews because they're always looking for guys to come on and fill time. So I said to them, I'm like, they played the Jim Rome show every afternoon for three hours. And I pitched them. I said, why don't I come back and I'll I'll do an afternoon show and uh, just basically on the centers, and they said, we'd love it. So I went down during the Stanley Cup finals and did a week-long show with one of the guys on the radio, 
we set up on Elgin Street and uh, my friend of mine owned a bar and he had like a tiki bar in the parking lot because this is this is this is the end yeah. of May. So we did this show for a week in this tiki bar and people were coming down on Elgin oh, Street. Cool. So that's that's how I started doing the broadcasting. And then after I did that radio, I hold on one second, Yorkie. I just want to rewind because this is an important uh, part when a when a player retires. Uh, you know, I I was grateful for the NHLPA as well. I did that. I did that program as well. The it's called the mm -hmm. Life After uh, mm -hmm. Hockey Program, and they have all kinds of different workshops that you can go to based on what your interests yeah. might be. One of the programs that they offer is the uh, the the broadcasting yeah. one, and I did the same thing because uh, they say it takes up to uh, and these are statistics that the the NHLPA has gotten that. You know, it, it take, could take up to two years before uh, a player that's, you know, had a lengthy career uh, figures out how they're going to fit into the world without, you know, as a player. Uh, and I just thought that, you know, that program really, really helped me kind of set me up for that for the next phase of life. And I, it sounds like it did the same thing. Yeah, for well, I, I for sure, for sure it did. And it. And it and it's funny because when I was in when I was in high school, I, I was a terrible public speaker. I didn't have a lot of confidence speaking in front of crowds. And then I decided to do this. And then um, I doubled down on it. I did the broadcasting course and then I wanted to keep getting better. So then I found out they were offering these public speaking courses and level one, two, three and four. So I took all four of the public speaking courses to try and get better at talking because I wanted to really go, I wanted to go all in on and see if I could uh, get in in this broadcasting gig. So I did the public speaking. And then this is the mistake a lot of guys make in when they want to do something as far as media and broadcasting, they sit around and they think people are going to come to them. Yeah. They'll, they'll come to you yeah. if you're Gretzky or if you're Messier, but if you're, if you're just yeah. a guy that had a decent career, they're not going to come to you. So I started making calls and the first call I said was to the auto radio station. So I said, yeah, we'll, we'll start using you and you can fill in when guys are away. So I started filling in on the radio that year, uh, working here, working there. And then the following year, uh, Gary Galley, who, you know, played in the NHL a long time, left the radio yeah. station to become full time on uh, Sportsnet. So I, I then jumped in full time on the radio and started doing radio full time. And then, while I was doing that, I was coaching my kids' hockey teams. I was coaching. I would flip-flop with my two boys. I would coach one the one year, one the next year. And this went on for about four years. And in the meantime, I was contacting Sportsnet, trying to get on with them. And uh, I convinced them to get me on their broadcast with the Ottawa Senators. And they started using me between periods. So I was doing uh, – then I was doing – radio plus TV intermissions for Sens games. And then I started traveling, flying to games, doing that. And then uh, three years later, so this is probably five years after I'm done playing, Sportsnet liked what I was doing and then offered me a job doing the Montreal Canadiens games where it was like 40, 50 games a year where I became the, the lead color commentator. So that went on for wow. three years. And then all of a sudden you start building up a resume. And I was, Pitt, I was terrible at the beginning. Like, just like hockey, you need reps. Um, and I, and I yeah. practiced too. Like I did the radio. I, uh, I would go in and do like local call-in shows. I, they told me when I was doing the broadcasting workshops, they said, anytime you get a chance to get on camera, do it. Just get reps, reps, reps. So I kept doing that. I would go in and do this show on local Rogers TV after a game, sends call-in shows, whatever, just doing stuff, doing stuff to try and get better. So finally I got better, and then Sportsnet started using me on Hockey Night in Canada games. So I, I worked my entire way up to Hockey Night in Canada games, and then I was uh, wow. I was one of Sports, Sportsnet's main broadcasters, and then, uh, and then COVID came. <laughs> so yeah. now – you know, fast forward, I was with Sportsnet. Um, things changed there. And uh, fast forward to today where I'm not really doing much with Sportsnet anymore. And this whole industry is kind of changing a little bit. 
where I've decided now to start doing a podcast, which I'm doing today in Ottawa. I do a podcast with uh, with Bobby Ryan and Brett Wallace um, after being with Sportsnet for roughly 10 years. Um, so, yeah. Oh, no, was no. It- Were you ready for that to be done? I mean, that because that's a grind being – you got to be – you're – you have to rank more than the players are. Um, I mean, it's a grind being well, a the travel, the travel is way different than playing because you're not on the charter. You're flying and you miss a lot of your kids' stuff. I I still like it. Yeah. Um, I'm still contemplating maybe doing it in the future. But it's a very competitive business. It's a very competitive yeah. business, the, uh, the broadcasting, because there's really only – there's really only five color commentating jobs with Sportsnet, and it's become more competitive than ever because now the major networks, they want – you're now competing against women's because they want women on the broadcast as well. So it's not just you're a retired NHL player. You're naturally going to get on. No, they want, there's – you're competing with way more people for these jobs now, which is fine. I understand that. Yeah. So are you uh, are you content – where you are in life right now? I'm never content, Pitt. <laughs> yeah, boy. No, you're always trying to think of stuff that potentially you want to do. Um, we'll see. The podcasting stuff is 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 fun, but I'm I'm always restless. I'm always thinking of something else. Um, for now, this this will. I'm doing this until July, and then uh, I'll reevaluate this summer. And I've thought of coaching. I really love coaching. Um, one of the things I kind of left out throughout our talk was uh, I also owned a junior A team while I was broadcasting. So I was an owner and then started coaching junior A for three years. So I was juggling that around while broadcasting. Um, and uh, oh, wow. two years ago, I wasn't doing as many games uh, for Sportsnet. So I, I, I became a full-time junior A coach, which was roughly 50, 60 games a year plus playoffs. And I really, really enjoyed that. The coaching was a ton of fun. And uh, I actually contemplated maybe trying to pursue that. And uh, the natural progression to that would be try and go to the Ontario Hockey League and and become a coach in that league. And then if you're good there, you can get to the NHL. Um, But again, you got to weigh the option of, okay, if I do that at age 52, turning 53, I don't know if I'm ready to do 60, 70 junior A games, uh, relocate to a new town and try and chase it because you're either all in or you're not. And I I, I don't know oh. if I want to go all in on coaching because something then has to give, right? And for for most of my life, People can say that what what you want, but your family always takes a back seat. Yeah, they always do, and and yeah. you know, there's a reason why seventy percent of NHL coaches are divorced. <laughs> it's 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 yeah. hockey's hockey becomes your life again, right? And as much as I love the game, it's an internal struggle you have. You want to be part of the game, you love coaching, you love being part of it, but at what cost? are you willing to, to do, to do that? And that's a, that's something that, mm-hmm. that you have to weigh and something I still weigh almost every day because I, I love coaching. Coaching is the next best thing to playing, but there's, there's a price that comes with deciding to do that. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, you, you're working for someone, you know, you don't have yeah. the freedom that you, well, you have. That you have now the cool you know the cool thing was when i owned this junior a team you can do what you want you're the owner you're the coach you're everything and uh and it's and it's actually <laughs> a great level of hockey it, be, it would be similar to like the bchl the alberta junior league as far as the canadian leagues go where all these all these young men kids are trying to get scholarships so there's something on the line and you're actually helping kids chase their dreams which i found very cool very rewarding lots of fun um but lots of time it's 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 a huge time commitment where uh, i got two boys now that are both playing college hockey one's in canada one's in the states 
and I enjoy going to watch their games. Um, so it's like, do I, so that, that's the internal battle you're always going with yourself. You, you want to do something, but you're something else will, will lose out if you decide that. Right. So as we heard, um, you know, you, you had a lot of, a lot of great things that happened, but, uh, in order to get that along that journey, you had some uh, challenges that you had to get through and it, it just wasn't one year. I mean, it was, you know, there were parts yeah. of every year, but some years were even worse than that. Uh, you talked about, you really struggled with, with confidence and, you know, beating yourself up. How did, I can't remember if we talked about it in the, the first episode, but we can talk about it again. How did you get better at uh, managing your thoughts in a more productive way? Keeping busy. <laughs> did you work with no, anyone? I didn't. I had to figure it out on my own. It was, uh, and honestly, I was, I was pretty confident when I was, it was, my confidence got destroyed my first year junior A. Like that was my, my whole mental psyche took a beating that first year junior A where well, you, you said you were going to yeah, quit, right? You were almost going to quit yeah. that year. So, just you just unfortunately in our in our era, Pitt, as you know, you you kind of had to sink or swim on your own. You didn't you didn't really have the the resources that many of the kids have today, and it was like suck it up and and be tough and fight through it. And I do believe though that that learning how to deal with adversity and having things really difficult when you're young makes you makes you learn how to fight through things and you have to and 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 you have to be mentally tough enough to do that but it's it's sink or swim and uh and and honestly i had i had a my parents were great maybe if my situation was different where I didn't have the support from my family. That's maybe I, things could have been different because I, uh, I, yeah. my parents, when I was on those troubling times were down at my games all the time, down watching, down taking me for breakfast the next morning. Um, and I had great friends when I went home for the summer, I had friends. I still keep today. My, I, my high school buddies, I'm still friends with today. Um, so I had, I could get away from the game, I guess would be the, the, the correct answer. Like in the summer, I really got away from the game. I, uh, I, I, I worked out and yeah. did what I needed to do, but I, growing up, I was doing baseball. It, it, I wasn't just hockey centric. I had different things. And as I got older in the summer, I would, you know, I'd go out with my buddies and we'd, we'd blow it out now and then like we'd go out for some, for yeah. some beers, have a good time. I would uh, I would do things so I so you gave you gave your 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 brain a chance to to kind of unwind once in a while. Yeah, and back then, I mean, um, that that was pre-internet mainstream. Mm-hmm. You know, now there there's you know you can find information. You type out, I feel like crap after a game. Yeah. What can I do about it? And you know, um, and there's a there's a whole you know, new industry of people that are working with athletes on, on, you know, exercising Mm -hmm. their mind uh, because there, there's people that that's what they do. Just like uh, uh, nutritionists or conditioning coach uh, the same thing with the mind now. So I just, uh, my messaging to, to players is that, you know, it's, it's something that you can work on managing if, you're like everyone else in this world. You know, there's times during the day where your mind, you know, is beating the crap yeah. out of yourself yep. and it can be difficult. And then when you throw adolescence in there, hormones and, uh, you know, a, a tough loss or a tough coach, I mean, it can go south one in thing, a hurry. One thing with my parents too, and I wouldn't, I'd say my mom was was super, super confident and she'd kind of lie to you sometimes. And even if you played well, she'd tell you you played great. <laughs> but, but yeah, the one thing they didn't allow me to do was feel sorry for myself ever, 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 ever. And never, cause it's so easy to make yourself be a victim. 
well, poor me, poor me. Yep. I can't, I'm, I'm having bad luck. And, and one thing I will say about today's society, too many people want to be victims. And I, that kind of bothers me. And I find if, if, if you, if you say to yourself, I'm not going to be a victim, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to battle. I'm going to, and listen, it's, it's easier said than done for some people, but my parents were always of the mind where fight through things, um, work harder. Don't blame the other guy. You do what you can do to make your situation better. And I, I always tried to become a hard worker by doing that. And, uh, you know, to the era you and I came through too, Pitt, like when you were young, if, if you went up to your parents, you said, ah, I hurt my leg. I hurt my arm. My mom was like, okay, get the knife out. Let's go. I'm going to cut it off. Or <laughs> they're like, you're, you're 10 years old and you went to your parents. You're like, I hate you. I'm going to run away. My mom's like, okay, here's a suitcase. Off you go. Like there was, there was no, there was no sympathy. It was like, and not to yeah. say they weren't caring parents, but it was like, it was, it was, it was different. Um, but uh, no, my parents, my parents did things and they, you know, everybody in my family, I like to say, came out being a successful person and we didn't come from a lot. Like we did not come from a lot. We all yeah. had jobs. We all worked. We, uh, we, none of us were, maybe I was called a little bit by mom telling me, uh, lying to me, but for the most part, for the most part, it was tough love. Yeah. We all have that grandpa, you go running up to him and say, Grandpa, I hurt my toe. And he goes, long way from your right? heart, kid. Get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rep. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so you talked about the podcast, yeah. John. Um, where can where can people find you if they want to become a fan of uh, you guys over yeah, there? Well, the up north in yeah, Ottawa. You can, well, you can find the podcast. It's on all major streaming networks. It's on Spotify. YouTube. It's called C Coming In Hot, the at Coming In Hot podcast. It's myself, Brent Wallace, Bobby Ryan. Um, we don't go as deep as uh, as your podcast, uh, Pet. We're not we're not quite as deep. I like to have uh, not that we're not having some laughs here, but we uh, it's a fun show. It's a fun show. We were on um, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and it's always available online. It's uh, it's a good lesson. We talk a lot about the Ottawa Senators, but uh, the NHL as well. We'll be talking about the upcoming playoffs as well coming up. So I got one thing, one more question before I let you go from a, a podcasting standpoint, sure. because when you're going to do it, you're either going to be someone that's providing information or an opinion. Do you get controversial in your opinions? I mean, do you go to the far right or do you kind of stay, you know, more neutral? All I do when I speak I tell the truth. I've got, I just tell the truth. And when somebody asks me a question and this is the, to me, this is the beautiful thing about doing a podcast. You have no agenda. Like I'm, I'm basically yeah. just, I'm going on my podcast and versus let's say, for example, if you're in the U S and you're a broadcaster for an American NHL team, you can't go on and and say your true opinion if things are going poorly for the team because you're going to hurt the brand. So it's yeah. you're in you're in a tight position um and that's fine it's totally understandable like anybody that works for a company you can't you can you can never really truly say your true opinion because there's always there's always a an agenda with, for what you're doing. Yeah. So the nice thing about doing a podcast is you just tell the truth and that's what I try and do. I just, uh, I'll, if I'm asked a question, if we have a topping, I'll give my exact opinion of what I think. And sometimes people agree with it. Sometimes they, they won't. And if it's the same thing when things are going well, I'll say why things are going well. Why I think, why I think, for example, the Ottawa Senators are doing well and which players are doing well, which players aren't doing well. And, and, um, you don't sugarcoat things and you also 
when things are going well, like I said, you, you, you just tell the truth. And it's like anything. It's the old, it's the old Lou Holtz video. Remember we used to watch that pit, the, the lessons in life. <laughs> one of Lou Holtz's number one things is just tell the truth. If you tell, if you tell the truth, yeah. you're usually in a good place. Yeah. Simplicity. Right? Well, Jason, this show has come to an end, my friend. I want to congratulate you on an amazing hockey life. Uh, if there's any of you young hockey hopefuls out there that are looking for someone you can learn a few things from uh, and model yourself after, after hearing Mr. York's hockey journey, I think there's a few learning puzzle pieces you can take away from this interview and add to your own story. Yorkie, thanks for being here and making the game of hockey so much better than when you found right. it. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time, my friend. And uh, if there's anything that I can help uh, with you, what, whatever you got going on, please don't hesitate to ask. Thanks, Pitt. It was great. Uh, it was great catching up and I really enjoyed it. Perfect. Well, uh, hi to the family. And, uh, the next time I'm up in Ottawa, which we may be planning a little, uh, trip up here, up there in the fall, uh, and then take a train across over to nice. the Maritimes. My wife oh, and I, you'll Lisa. Enjoy that. so yeah, if, we get, if we get up to Ottawa, Definitely get together. Send me a today. text, man, and we'll go out. Okay. All right. Don't hang up yet. Uh, thanks for being here, and I will. Uh, we'll see each other when we see, see each other. It. it never ceases to amaze me how different each hockey player's journey is, but similar in the same breath. Nobody has ever had a hockey career minus missed attempts, heartache, mistakes, disappointments, pain, or the agony of defeat. That side of the game will always reveal itself from time to time. But what makes a successful hockey career is if you have the ability to get back up when you get knocked down enough to outlast the competition where you just won't go away. If you have to put a face on what that player may look like, I think it would resemble Jason York in a lot of ways. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you enjoyed meeting Jason York and hearing about his hockey journey. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It would really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon and do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.